I understand. Right, it's 30, so why don't we go ahead? Um, we want to get started, or we want to wait a few more minutes and see if. But let's just wait one more minute, Annalise, and make because it's just 6:30, and there's still some people hopping on. Not a problem. Oh, look at all these people I haven't seen in so long. I remember all of you, even though you've disappeared from my life. <laughs> It's such a strange time, isn't it? Yeah. It so is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Annalise, I guess. Hey, welcome. How are you? Good. How you Good. doing? Good to see you, Gabrielle. Oh, it's great to see you. Yeah. Okay, what do you think, Annalise? Are we good? Should we start? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and get started, then we can go. Okay, well, we're a little past 6.30, so I guess we'll start and um, others can join in if they're a little bit late to the call. Um, yeah. I have to apologize. apologize. What's that? Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to apologize for my appearance. I, have, I was on a Zoom training call from 1 o'clock uh, this afternoon until 5.30. And I thought, well, I have a half an hour. I can try to look nice or I can practice a little self-care and go for a walk. So I went for a walk. Thus, <laughs> this is what you get. <laughs> Great, Carrie. Anyway, welcome to everyone. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. And I am so happy and honored to um, be able to provide a little introduction for our guest speaker tonight, who is, who is a, a wonderful friend and, and colleague. Um, and by way of introducing him, I, I would like to go back in time just a little bit and um, introduce you to how I met Lenny Hoffman. So uh, Annalise, do you want to throw the first slide up there? Yep, I'll pull it up now. Okay. So those of you who have been in town for a while or who are um, readers of the Sarasota Herald Tribune, which many of you know, I'm the, I'm the lead columnist for the Herald Tribune. And um, I'm, I'm also a founding member of, of Sarasota Strong. But um, in 2016, I received a, uh, fellowship from the Carter Center for Mental Health Journalism in Atlanta. Um, and it was a fellowship to do a year long project around trying to um, eliminate um, bias against people with mental health conditions. And the name of the project was Facing Mental Illness, The Art of Acceptance. And um, go ahead, Annalise, next slide. And this project was kind of a two-fold project. Um, it uh, was a journalism project and an art project. And the journalism part was um, that every week I would interview someone who had some kind of mental health condition. And it was um, a wide range, anything from anxiety to bipolar disorder to schizophrenia. Uh, just uh, anything that fell along the spectrum of a mental health challenge. And I would interview that person and write their story about how they have uh, dealt with their, um, their challenges. And those ran every Sunday in the Herald Tribune. But then the other part of the project was an art project. And um, we held some open art workshops and anyone um, who who had um, you know, a mental health challenge was invited to either on their own or by coming to these workshops, come and create a self portrait that in some way um, was a projection of 
what they felt inside about their their mental health condition. So, um, and we ended up having a big art show and it was, it was really wonderful. It was uh, one of the best projects I've, I've ever done in my journalism career. Um, next slide. So here are a few just of the, uh, the people who uh, participated in the project and you can see there was a wide, uh, wide range of, of ages and races and conditions and um, I, I, it's amazing to look at these pictures because every one of these people I consider such a, such a good friend and, I'm, and I just have such intense feelings about all the people pictured here. But okay, um, next slide. I'm getting emotional just, uh, just looking at this. I haven't looked at these for a long time. So um, I just thought I'd throw in a few slides here to give those who did not see the art exhibit some idea of the caliber of the work that we ended up with. Um, the, um, the picture on the left is, uh, was from a new college uh, student um, who had um, severe ADHD. Um, and it was an amazing sculpture and the, the little pillbox on the figure's head lifted up and, and um, there was a little switch you could turn on. And then on the other side of the head, there was a little window where you could peek inside the brain of this sculpture. And um, there were all these little things in there. There was like a clock ticking and numbers and just to, you know, showing the, the busyness of her brain. It was amazing. And uh, the portrait on the right was from uh, a wonderful um, older man who um, had spent his entire life feeling ostracized because of his mental health condition. Um, and his, his picture was called The Alien. Next slide. And just a couple more. The one on the left um, was from a, a Ringling College graduate who um, I, I think you can see um, in, in the photograph that, that, that her self-portrait is entirely made up of, of words. Um, and uh, you, can, you can pick out some of the words here and there. And it was titled, My Illness Consumes Me. Wow. And the, and the portrait on the right was, um, again, by, by an older woman. That little white strip that you see on the portrait was actually a, a Band-Aid. And when she first brought the portrait in for the show, I said, oh, look, this, you know, this Band-Aid got stuck to your picture. And she said, no, that's part of the portrait, um, indicating how we, you know, try to put a Band-Aid on these conditions and don't really get at what, you know, may have catalyzed them initially. So it was an amazing uh, art show. It was an amazing project. And one of the very first people that I invited to participate when I had first come up with the idea of the project was Lenny Hoffman. Can I have the next slide, Emily? Oh, oops, I had forgot about that slide, yeah. So um, this is a picture of Lenny when he, um, you'll see he's lost a little weight. <laughs> he, he looks a little bit, um, a little bit rosier in this picture. <laughs> um, and the portrait on the right is the portrait that he made for the show. I had met um, Lenny prior to my starting the project because I had done an article about uh, him and his collaborator on a, a, a web cartoon strip that he was doing called Our Mad Life, which was just this wonderful uh, um, cartoon strip about dealing with mental health challenges. And, and it's funny and, and real and poignant. And just, if you haven't checked it out, you should check it out. Um, but so I knew him already from that story and I asked him if he would like to participate in this project in the art show. 
Um, and he not only immediately said yes, he said, I'm going to have the biggest piece of artwork there. He asked me, how big, how big can I go? And um, he did indeed have one of the largest uh, paintings and you see it there. Um, but I just really can't say enough good things about Lenny. He participated in the project so enthusiastically. He, um, he did the artwork, he, he uh, did the profile in the paper and he also helped me out by participating. Uh, we put together a documentary film about, um, about the project that was screened at the Sarasota Film Festival. And Lenny agreed to be part of the documentary as well. So I sort of feel like there, there wouldn't have been a Facing Mental Illness project without his um, participation and support. And he has a really incredible story to share with you tonight. I know it's going to be um, really a, a meaningful experience for you to hear him tell his story. So um, that being said, I turn it over to my good friend, Lenny. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, that's quite an introduction. Um, so I, to introduce myself, I'll say my name is Lenny Hoffman and I am an artist, a poet, a cartoonist, and a host at a restaurant. Uh, you will see some of my art today, but what really moves me, what fuels my fire, is being a dungeon master in fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. If you don't know what that means, that's fine. It just means <laughs> I am King Dork. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Um, I'm here today to talk about my experience with mental illness in NAMI or the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the country's largest grassroots organization devoted to educating, supporting, and advocating for people affected by mental illness. And that would include both peers, that's the word we use for people who have mental illness, and family members and friends, et cetera. Um, I volunteer for NAMI as a Connections Recovery Support Group Facilitator. That's the support group for adults living with mental illness. We meet on Zoom and in person every other week. I'm also an in our own voice presenter, which is what this is uh, tonight. I'm a facilitator for the peer-to-peer -peer class, and I also do a thrice weekly webcomic for NAMI called The Quest, and I have an example of that uh, coming up. Um, to get us started, uh, this presentation will have three sections. There will be a what happened, uh, a what helps, and what next. And uh, this is the video uh, from NAMI for what happened. So if we can watch this, and then I will tell my story afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Henry. Hi, Andrea. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Hi, I'm Amanda. Alika, how are you? I'm good. Hey, Alex, I'm Doug. Nice, nice to, meet you. to meet you. I'm a graphic designer and I work for a nonprofit. I have a little baby boy who's almost a year old. I have two children and they're not babies. I have a 15-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son. I have a brother and a sister that I'm very close with and my mother and father are still together. Um, they've been together for 30 plus years. I enjoy uh, the beach and spending time with my nine month old puppy, Snoopy, who I love with all my heart. I consider myself a community activist. I work with people with addiction issues, uh, people that are homeless. What I really like to do is uh, draw comic books. I've been doing it since I was in like middle school. My diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder bipolar type. Borderline personality disorder. Bipolar disorder. My diagnosis is major depressive disorder. I think I tell my story so I don't forget where I've been. I want to be able to dispel those myths that there, that's out there about mental health conditions. Yeah. I'm an actual person and I have a voice and I have a story to share. I started having symptoms of depression and who am I existential questions since I was 15. And I used to say to myself, I'm having my midlife crisis at 15 years old. There was about a three year period in my life where everything I did and said was uh, 
sort of a product of the world of delusions that I was living in. I would call out of work um, for days on end. I didn't eat. Um, I slept all the time. For quite some time, I didn't even recognize my symptoms because hypomania can look organized to me. So I can get a lot done in a very little bit of time. It didn't become a problem until they noticed that I wasn't sleeping for like days on end. I hallucinated every single day, and then the anxiety sort of builds and builds and builds until it becomes kind of like a paranoia where, you know, everything is sort of out to get you. My way of dealing with it primarily was with, with drugs, um, and I know now that that's suicide on the installment plan. I started self-harming more. My friends, when I was a junior, saw the scars, and it was horrible. They judged me. They said that I was doing it for attention. Some people said bipolar disorder. Some people said ADHD. Some people said PTSD. And none of them seemed to make sense for me. It was a diagnosis that evolved over time. Several different hospitalizations, several different diagnoses until one eventually stuck. I was a special education teacher, so there were kids in my class that had ADHD or had bipolar disorder. And just listening to those teachers and how they talked about those kids, it didn't make me want to come out and share what I had just learned about myself. I felt that I wouldn't be accepted and that all, all my work would be dismissed as, you know, not um, credible because I had a mental illness. After I lost my job, I became homeless. Um, I committed minor crimes to feed my drug habit, um, lived on the streets, and finally eventually was arrested and sent to state prison. That's the big turning point for me. Um, okay, so thank you uh, for showing that video. Um, one of the things when I prepared this uh, presentation, um, I was thinking a lot about the, 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 the term of trauma or what trauma meant. And so um, connecting this through uh, in terms of trauma actually got me started with something I experienced uh, when I was very young. So I'll tell a, a little story and that'll get me into, into going. But um, when I was a baby, the house where I grew up had a screen door that was easy to push open to get out of, but it was kind of difficult to get it open again to get back inside, or at least it was for me. Uh, my father, <laughs> Had a drinking problem and one night he came home and while he was supposed to be watching me he passed out um, when he finally woke up I was outside the door curled up in a little ball asleep um, I can only imagine what I had been doing out there until I fell asleep um, I don't remember this experience uh, per se, but similar situations and other trauma that I experienced in my youth um, turned me into somewhat of an emotionally sensitive child. I was a prone to emotional overload and um, that kind of came to look like getting into a lot of fights at school and losing my temper. Um, my father had sobered up uh, when I was still young. So by this point in time in my life, um, he was a minister, uh, in a church and had turned his life around and um, actually came to be very, very helpful and provided some crucial guidance on how uh, to think of myself about what it was like being picked on at school and to not allow myself to get to the point of emotional overload. Um, I grew up into a seemingly happy child. I did well in school, but I was secretly depressed and I endured suicidal ideation. Um, so as promised, uh, I've got some artwork, an example of some of my artwork. So if we could have the next slide, please. So this one, um, has the wonderful title that I came up with when I was in high school, La Disintegración del Hombre, or The Disintegration of the Man, um, Watercolor and Ink. It's about 16 by 20. Um, and I did that in when I was in high school, so that dates me in 1997. Um, 
my life seemed to progress though. Uh, I went to college, I got married, I went to grad school, I had a baby boy, I got a job as a history teacher, I even bought a house. Um, I had gone to therapy and I was diagnosed as depressive and I started taking medication. Things seemed to be okay until the cracks started showing. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. So this is a self-portrait that I did um, in 2010. This is before I went crazy. Um, I uh, brought this portrait into school and one of my students said, that couldn't possibly be you, Mr. Hoffman. It has a full head of hair. Um, thank you for laughing. Um, I was working as a teacher during the day, an adjunct professor in the evening, and I was uh, a commercial painter for my father-in-law on the weekends. I was working seven days a week, and I was uh, in my new house spending my spare time um, doing uh, art again. Um, things could not keep up with that. If you could please go to the next slide. Um, Here's another self-portrait I did. Uh, this one you can kind of see uh, my tiredness and my kind of worn out um, look, uh, maybe a more realistic hairline. Um, uh, my marriage had failed. Uh, I was uh, moved out. Um, summer came and so I went from working seven days a week to working zero. Um, as the rules and expectations that I uh, had been living under fell away, um, so too did my grasp on reality. Um, this time period, I generally call my crazy period, but I was not crazy yet. Um, one morning, I was about to take my girlfriend to an airport, to the airport, and I shot myself in the face with pepper spray. Um, once I had taken her to the airport, I got lost. This was, I was living in Jacksonville at the time and I had a hallucination that I was God. I felt the power and the energy of the universe flowing within me, mixing with me and my own energy, mixing with the universe. Um, if it wasn't for what happened next, this would have been one of the most beautiful moments in my life. And everything changed after that trauma. Uh, I spoke differently. I thought differently. My thoughts were racing. I felt like my brain was on fire. I felt totally invincible. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, here's a piece of art from that time period. Um, this was uh, a girlfriend that I had at the time. If you can see closely all around the edges of the painting are uh, writing. Uh, across the bottom, I can decipher, it says, sharpen my mind. Um, most of everything else is written in a script that I no longer um, understand. Um, I was writing like that on everything. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. Here is another one. This is um, a portrait I did of uh, Barack Obama as he was beginning his re-election campaign. Um, the painting was two-sided. One side was a blessing. The other side was a curse. This is something of a curse. If you notice up at the top, there's a error in the photograph, which is causing it to kind of be misadjusted uh, like that. So that is uh, what you see there. Um, it's the only photograph I have of that painting, but um, as you can tell, it is quite a bit different. Um, the summer could not last forever though. So um, school came back into session in the fall and I didn't last very long. I was acting inappropriately and doing all sorts of strange things. Um, the students loved it. I had one uh, class laughing so hard that a student was uh, literally crying. There were tears coming from his eyes. He was laughing so hard. I was dressing inappropriately. I was doing things. I was throwing pens and books. Um, 
Eventually, the principal got involved, and uh, I was told to leave the school and that if I would come back, uh, I would be uh, arrested for trespassing. Um, being that I was crazy, uh, I definitely went back, and then I was uh, arrested. Um, my father once again uh, came to my rescue and uh, met my public defender and gave, told my public defender what sort of a person I was. Um, the public defender had me evaluated and actually put a lot of time and attention into my case. I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder bipolar type, and the public defender was able to convince the judge uh, to let me out of jail with the understanding that I would immediately go to the hospital and be treated for this disease. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. Um, this portrait is done in my early recovery period. Um, this part of this section is gonna start our second section, um, which is called What Helps. Um, when I was in the hospital, I learned many skills that I would use um, in my recovery. Um, perhaps the first would be the importance of taking medication regularly. Um, once I could feel the difference in my own head um, and I could feel being normal, put that in quotes again, um, I began religiously taking my medication and became like clockwork. Every night before going to bed, I take my meds. Um, another thing is that I need regular sleep and I need it at night. Um, and so I make sure that I follow the rhythms of the day. I have a routine, something especially important during uh, the quarantine. And then I make sure that I get enough amount of rest at sleep, uh, uh, rest of sleep at night um, is a key part of my recovery. And if I notice myself not sleeping well, um, I take notice. Um, Another thing that helps me a lot in my mental illness um, is that um, I have a wide support network. Um, so I alluded in the, my story that there were um, some things where I acted out and some of these things were crimes. Um, I mentioned one that was a misdemeanor. There was also one that was a felony. Uh, I was not let out of jail for that one. Um, but uh, early in my recovery, uh, what that meant was that I spent a fair amount of time in jail, which is not the most, um, I'm not sure how to say it. It's not a good place to go to be healthy. It's not a good place to go and um, recover. Um, most of the people in there are, can be quite violent and aggressive and, um, most of the people who are doing any sort of thinking are thinking to themselves, how can I get away with it next time? They're not thinking about how to live a good life. Um, so once again, my father uh, stepped in and he made sure that I could call him every day. Uh, I would call my sister about twice a week. I would call my mom about once a week. Um, eventually my uh, ex-wife uh, would bring my son uh, to visit me and um, a family friend would also come to visit me. Um, having good contact with regular sane non-criminal people was very important to helping me live in recovery. Uh, now it is a lot easier to have a good wide support of friends and family that I can reach out to when I need help. But making sure I have that good uh, uh, participation, uh, a, a good place in my community is very helpful to my mental health. Um, I'm also participate in the, in the Connections Recovery Support Group, and that is a meaningful way for me to spread the love that I have received to others um, and, uh, and to also get that support um, for myself. Um, Another good thing uh, about where I'm at in my life is that um, I'm at the point where uh, maintenance is something um, that I um, am able to do. So a lot of my recovery 
is uh, taking care of my body and taking care of my mind. So um, making sure that I'm eating healthy food, uh, something that my girlfriend now is doing. She's having me use a food tracker so I can keep track of all the food that's coming in. So I make sure that I'm eating enough. Uh, I work out regularly. I go uh, walking. I do jogs. I do yoga in the morning. Um, I meditate and I watch my breathing. And I'm also active um, in my church as well as the Buddhist temple and reading scriptures every night. Um, doing art continues to be something very important to me. It has been a big part of how I have come to see myself again as someone who is not uh, an ex-criminal, who is not um, a, 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 a a mentally ill person. Um, being an artist is something important to me. It's a way for me to give my gifts. If we can go to the next slide. This is a piece, uh, a drawing that I created for uh, my church. This was featured on the cover of the bulletin. Um, the pastor of the church asked me to do this drawing. Um, it's from an experience that I had while I was in jail where I was kind of um, just doing every little thing I could to get a bit of sunlight on my face and uh, how good that felt when I was able to get that. Um, I've also done uh, paintings. I've donated paintings for NAMI and uh, I've also donated a painting to the CAD Depot and I've gotten into web comics, um, which Carrie mentioned a little bit about. Uh, can you please bring up the next slide? So this is uh, a comic strip. Uh, it was done um, by my uh, collaborator, Robin Snoocher. She did a lot of the writing and uh, I did the art. Um, I'll give you all a chance. Well, I guess I'll read it. So we're in the Sunnydale Health Mental Health Facility and she says it's outside time. And then uh, our character, his name is Evan, who looks suspiciously like me. Um, is out looking at the flowers and she says, are you okay? And he says, the flowers are telling me a story. And she says, what are they saying? And he says, to wilt or not to wilt? That is the question. Um, it's something that I would do from time to time, especially when I was in, um, in jail, just spending time looking at the grass and seeing the little plants that are there. And so that was something that uh, Robin had written based off of my experience. Um, Robin also uh, has mental uh, illness and writes a lot from her point of view. Um, art has given me a voice to express myself and my experience with mental illness has given that voice something to say. So uh, the next uh, section, uh, in this presentation is the what's next. Um, here's the web comic that I am working on now. Um, this is called The Quest. It is fantasy characters. This is something I've created entirely by myself. Uh, so here we have Edriel the elf and she says, guess what, Ogrek, my pineapple is growing. And Ogrek, who is an ogre says, my orchid is blooming, Ed. It's a miracle, an everyday miracle. And Ed says, hold on. Let me take a photo. Oh, that makes me laugh. Okay, at least it makes me laugh. Um, the big thing that's next for me in my life is um, kind of doing what I need to do in order to make enough money to live something like a middle-class lifestyle. Um, I've worked a variety of jobs since getting out of jail. My current job is I work as a full-time host uh, at a restaurant, uh, which is the Boatyard Waterfront Bar and Grill. It's on Sickney Point Road. Uh, it's right before you get to Siesta Key on the left. It's a colorful little house. Um, excellent place to go. It's got an amazing view. Um, I've also started a business to sell my art called Glenkire Comics. Um, starting a business to sell comics in the same year that... Um, coronavirus hit uh, has meant uh, that I'm not making very much money at that right now. Uh, all the major comic conventions where I would be selling um, 
have uh, been canceled, but we'll s hopefully next year will be better for that. Um, and another thing that I've done that I think is worth mentioning is that I've written a graphic memoir uh, that tells uh, my story, kind of my point of view um, of what happened to me. Um, it is something that I um, am very proud of, but I have uh, uh, not been able to work on primarily uh, because I want to make sure that my son has the ability to read it for himself uh, before, uh, before it's published. And he is 13 right now. So I think when he is 18, I will uh, start doing what I can do to work on that project and release it as a book. Um, graphic memoirs are a thing now and I love them. Um, but right now it feels like what I'm doing is just doing what I can to pay child support every week and rent once a month and just plant the little seeds in the ground that can one day bloom into something beautiful. Um, I like to say that I keep my eyes on the prize. I want to be mentally strong enough um, to be there for my son if he has a crisis like mine, uh, the way that my father was there for me. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, the paintings that I've been working on. I did a series of landscapes um, during my time during uh, quarantine. And this is one of them. Um, this is uh, based off of my experience. I used to work down in Nokomis at the landfill and I took a photo one day and I've turned it into a painting of the scenery there. So I've, my goal is to do this sort of Van Gogh-esque uh, style artwork, but to do it of uh, Florida natural life um, and see if I can not try to make some money doing those. Um, I believe uh, that is what I have for presentation. Um, would we want to, oh, 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 I forgot about this one. Yes, the moon, Venus, and Jupiter at twilight. I've added that one as well. Is there any more? Nope, okay. <laughs> uh, so just an example of my art that I'm working on now. Um, and I believe maybe we might want to open this up to questions. Do you want me to go ahead and I can stop share and we can open up everyone to come and chat? Do you want to do it that way? Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, that's that. I guess we can do that. It's going to, uh, yeah, we may have, you're also welcome to ask a question in the chat if you, if you'd like to, but, um, I just want to say to Lenny, thank you for a, the the retrospective of your artwork was was uh, fascinating, and I'm really excited about your new work. It's, oh, thank you. It's, it's really really wonderful. So, um, so let's open it up. I'm sure there must be people with questions, so don't be shy. Uh, you can go ahead and and just speak up or put a question in the chat. Lenny, I have a question for Lenny. Um, first of all, Lenny, thank uh, you. Can you identify yourself just so we all know who's speaking? Oh, sure. I'm Kathleen Harnish McCune, joining in from the Kansas City area, a okay. guest of Andrea Ruth. So anyway, thank you all for letting us join in. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Lenny, thank you for sharing your story. I know how uh, hard that is, but also how um, healing that can be. I wonder, I have a son who has had mental illness for a good part of his life, ADHD, anxiety, um, OCD. Um, he's been through um, quite the roller coaster journey, uh, some choices uh, better than other choices. He's now 19 and I feel him really pulling away, which I know teenagers need to do, but I also know medication management is an issue. I know connection is an issue. And so I wondered if, I don't know if you can think back on your teenage years. I have been his kind of supporting adult in his life uh, throughout. You know, whenever he has a crisis, he calls me. We get the support wrapped around him he needs. I've just kind of always been there, but I wonder what that, how that support needs to change. 
in those teenage years. Is that a fair question? Um, yeah, I, th I think that's a fair question. Um, I mean, I think back to the, to the, where I was and it was, um, Kind of the hard part is is when I think back, I like I like my mother was always just a very loving, um, very supportive presence in my life. It was always there for me and felt support. And so much of my kind of mental health at that point in time when I was dealing with um, kind of some depression and anxiety um, to now, I mean, it's almost like I had to come to a place where I learned how to do it myself. Like I had to see the whole thing for myself. Um, my mother was so wonderful for me growing up. Um, but it, 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 I mean, it's like I still, I still went through all the hard times, you know what I mean? You know, a lot of the difficulties in the middle of it. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I'm. I'm. I, I, I'm not sure what else to say be, beyond that. Um, yeah, I. I it, it's definitely a part of it, and um, mm -hmm. knowing. I mean, I, I think just being there and being as supportive as you can be, the way you are being, I think is 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 going to just absolutely be wonderful. Uh, for him, I think that's going to be like a, 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 a backbone to build on. Um, so much of it is, is like I said, it's just coming to the place where you, I mean, even like um, in my, in my mental health journey since getting out of jail, learning to be my own person and not just do what my dad wanted me to do, not just, you know, my dad wants me to take my meds and he wants me to go to work and like coming to the place where, those were coming from my own side. Um, and part of that is I've, I've made decisions that my dad hasn't liked. Um, and I've got to deal with the consequences of those decisions. Um, but at the same point, I'm, I mean, I think he comes to a place where he respects where I'm at and I respect where he's at and we allow each other to be adults together. You know, we, we're not, we're not just living like child and, and parent, but. I, I think that's a great answer, Lenny. Um, and I just have to say that in my experience, um, Kathleen with my son as well, who, um, you know, has also been on this mental health journey that, um, and I have been a single parent for, for most of his life um, and was also his, you know, sort of, main and sometimes only support system, um, which was wonderful for him and awful for him. And there are still times when I know he's frustrated by feeling that I'm, you know, he's 35 now. He doesn't want mom hovering anymore. And he still loves my support and I know he appreciates it, but um, I think like Lenny, you know, it comes to a point where um, any, any one who is trying to become adult has to assume the responsibility for how they are going to manage their illness. And, you know, we took a lot of steps backward before we took, before he took the steps that he really needed to take on his own to manage uh, it. So I'm not just saying that you can kind of turn it over to him and it's all going to be, you know, smooth sailing. But I do think it's, it's um, critically important that that starts to happen. And I always am very conflicted when I, I'm contacted by a lot of parents just because I've been very public about um, my son's illness and, I, and his journey, I've written about it. And so a lot of parents contact me and I'm always um, distressed when I hear that there is someone who is um, 30 or 40 or older and who is still living at home and 
Uh, you know, the parents are getting older and they're worried about what's going to happen when they're no longer able to help or, or you know, or they're not around. Um, and I know from, from a fairly early stage, once my son was, uh, you know, was through the worst of his illness, that my whole goal was to help him become as independent as possible. So I think that's a goal to keep in mind um, as you go along. And, it, and it's probably going to come with a few backslides occasionally. Um, we have a question in um, from Andrea Blanche in the chat. At, she says, Lenny, can you talk specifically about how doing art helps with healing? Doing art helps with healing. Um, so much in so many ways. Um, when I was in the hospital uh, the first time, um, I mean, partly like in the hospital, there's just not a whole lot to do. So having art to work on is just, it's just, like having to act, you know, the, taking the time to put lines on a sheet of paper and, uh, and draw and color and just, just doing something like that. Um, it gives your mind something to focus on, something to think about other than, um, other than what's bothering you. You get to think about flowers or swords or battle axes or whatever it is that you're, you want to draw whatever it is that you're painting or, or whatever. It gives you something to think about, something to focus on. One of the wonderful things about it is that you get something when you are done. Um, so one of the things I love doing with my art is I love giving it as gifts. And it's this thing where I get to make something that's lovely and then I give it to someone and then they love it. And it's like this kind of happiness, uh, like one of those snowballs rolling down a hill where it's just picking up happiness as it goes and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the whole way down. Um, I love taking the time to look at things, to really look at things. Um, when I am doing a self portrait, uh, I will usually uh, do it with a mirror and I'll look at myself and, you know, there's something therapeutic I find about looking at an object and really going, what does that object really look at? Not, not what you think the object looks like, not what sort of preconceptions you have to the art, but like really like looking at something as something, you know, and, and letting go of any preconception. In the same way that for your mind, like doing that is good practice because like for depression, a lot of times what will happen is I will have a negative thought. It will be unrealistic. I'll go, oh, this is going to happen. And then I'll dwell on this unrealistic thought. I'm not really looking at the situation the way the situation really is. And then art, by looking at things that they really look at, gives me practice doing that, helps me do that. Um, and there's also the, just the meditative practice um, of getting in, you know, like there's like Zen tangles or things that people have done. I do something similar where I'll work on like a pattern where I'm just going down doing the same pattern over and over and over again. It, it focuses the mind, it purifies the mind and cleans the mind. Um, I feel like I could go on and on and on. Uh, I, I, um, I, I'm 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 half distracted, Lenny, because there's all these accolades for your uh, for your for what you're saying coming in on the chat room. So you might want to take a look at those. But um, I I just wanted to second that you know when I did that project that I talked about at the beginning of the um, of the conversation tonight. Um, it was an art project, but not everyone in it was an artist like Lenny, uh, like Lenny is. I mean, many of the people were initially quite reluctant um, to get involved because they said, oh, but I'm not an artist. I can't 
I can't do that. I can't even draw a stick figure. Um, but these workshops that we ended up having on Saturdays where people, we had all kinds of art supplies and then we had, you know, professional artists that could, uh, could help people if they wanted help. And um, they just ended up being these wonderful feel good sessions where everybody sat around and played with the different mediums that we had. And, you know, even for people who, who really weren't necessarily um, comfortable with the, the visual art form, ended up really loving it for just, you know, that meditative sense, that calm sense, that, that feeling of camaraderie with other people. Um, so I, I think even, you don't have to, you don't have to be an artist to derive um, some benefit from doing art. And it doesn't have to be visual art. My son happens to be a musician. And that's, you know, he'll go sit at the piano for hours. And that's what does it for him. So um, anyway, we have a lot, I, I, lots of questions coming in. So I want to I wanna get to a few of these. Um, this is a question from Sydney Turner asking, Lenny, are you interested in any new art mediums that you haven't been able to try yet? And do you find that different art mediums impact you in different ways? So yes, uh, so I'm gonna answer that uh, question in reverse. So yeah, like different mediums do affect, um, do affect differently. Um, uh, for me, there's also the, the two aspects of a medium when it comes down to it is like, what does it feel like to make with the with a medium? And then what does it look like to look at the medium? So like, for example, uh, something like oil painting, which I've done very little oil painting. Most of my paintings are acrylic. Um, oil painting, you can have a very different texture and thickness and experience of putting the paint on the canvas and what the canvas looks like when it's done. Um, one of the things that I got really into uh, during my crazy period um, and then afterwards was watercolor crayons. So I would get crayons and I would draw with a crayon and then I would go over it with water and it would produce this kind of watercolory effect. Um, and I loved doing those, those were excellent. And they are fairly, fairly new medium. Um, one of the big things that I'm thinking about, I've recently gotten, and I have it right here. I'll show you my, my new, so this is an iPad and it's got the iPad pencil. Ah, I'll put it away. But uh, I'm going to start doing the Quest digitally. So what I normally do with the Quest is I do it all on paper with pen and pencil, and then I scan it and that's how it gets up on the website. So I'm starting to work digitally um, and we're gonna see how that goes. I'm, I'm a little nervous about what it's gonna feel like to do a drawing where there's no friction of pen on paper. There's no kind of immediate tactile sense of what I'm doing. Um, so I'm a little curious about that. Um, I'm a little nervous about that, but um, one of the benefits though is that um, I think it'll be a little easier to incorporate color into it. So I'm gonna start using color more in the web comic. Uh, Our Mad Life, incidentally, which was the other web comic that has color, um, that was colored digitally by Robin Snoocher. So um, I would just do the black outlines. Um, okay, we have another question for you. This one is from Pamela saying, um, Thank you, Lenny, for your candor regarding the path your illness has taken you. What effect do you think your artwork has had on your illness? The illness and the artwork, um, I mean, so much of when I was, when I was um, ill, um, so much of the way I thought about myself at the time was 
with my artwork. Like I saw myself as this artist and I would, you know, the, the night that I went back to the school when I was trespassing, um, the purpose of that trip was to deliver a painting. Um, so there's a big part of my art uh, that runs through this. Um, it runs through like my, my illness and my expressions of it. Um, one of the things about, uh, about schizoaffective disorder and I think about uh, delusions in general is quite often there's this strong feeling of being special, of being unique, of being this one thing in a million years. Um, being an artist, uh, uh, a lot of times when you're doing your art and you're doing your paintings and you're like, am I the next Van Gogh? Like, am I going to die and become super famous and everyone's going to love me? Is, is there, does no one really understand where I'm at right now just because they just, they haven't caught up to my genius yet? And there's no way to know that. And so like, you just sit there thinking that, well, when I'm crazy, that I mean, those thoughts that it's a normal artist thoughts and the normal crazy thoughts and they just like supercharged together um they made super crazy thoughts um so yeah definitely uh art has played a role in 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 shaping my illness i mean so much of who i am is is an artist so it's it's so much of shapes everything in my life um, Lenny, there are so many comments in the chat commending your, your talk and your artwork. I'm going to make sure. I, I don't have time to read through all of them, but I want to make sure you see them. But there is one question from Pat Mahoney that I, I figured you might want to answer here while everyone's still listening. Do you take commissions? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So um, I, 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 I love to do commissions. Um, I love to do paintings. Um, Usually when I, when I try to sell my art, I, I kind of either go the watercolor route, which is a little bit more uh, economical from an art creation point of view. Um, it's just a sheet of paper with some watercolors on it. I can do it quite easily. Um, that being said, it then needs to be framed and put up on a wall, which can be kind of expensive. Or I go with uh, paintings, acrylic, um, which are more expensive because I have to procure a canvas. Um, but uh, they come ready to go up on the wall. If anyone interested in a commission, you can contact me. Uh, my email is lenny.hoffman at gmail.com, uh, spelled exactly as my name is, lenny.hoffman at gmail.com. Um, and I would love to, uh, I love doing uh, art for money. <laughs> it's a great feeling. That's the best way, right? Yeah. And I just saw Annalise posted my email, so thank you for that. Oh, great! And um, we have, we have, we're getting to the end of our session here, but we do have uh, another question here that I think is real interesting that you might uh, be interested in answering. This is from James and CNS. Uh, Lenny, as you might be aware, many of our prison institutions, federal, state, and local, are housing in order in the, inordinate number of individuals that are struggling with mental health issues. Have you thought of working in the institutions when the pandemic allows for it? Um, I have. Um, one of the issues with uh, federal and state prisons, um, and I'm not sure about local jails, but I am assuming that it is similar, is generally speaking, the people that they want to come into the jail um, to visit cannot be coming because they've been arrested. So, um, so a lot of times uh, going to visit at a state prison, uh, if you have a felony on your record, uh, they might not uh, they might not look happily on that. Um, that is what I have uh, looked into uh, so far about going into uh, uh, prisons and jails. I'm not against the idea. I like the idea, but I, I, I'm not sure it is really um, actually possible uh, to do that. Um, it might also be one of those things that if I'm out for like 10 years, sometimes policies will change depending if somebody has a clean record for 10 years. 
and my conviction is in 2012. So I'm getting close, close to my 10 year mark. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Well, um, Annalise, can we unmute everybody at the same time for a moment so they can clap? <laughs> I'm trying to here. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, Amazing. Thank you so much, Lenny. Thank you. Well done. Mary, you're on mute. Mary. Mary. Sorry, I'm not sure how I got muted. Um, I want to especially thank Lenny for that great presentation and for sharing his art and his journey with us. I know how much everyone appreciated it and I'm sure um, I want him to look through all these comments that I didn't get to read in the chat because they're all accolades. Um, just before we break up tonight, I wanted to share with you uh, what we have coming up for you um, at our next uh, Sarasota Strong uh, monthly forum, which is on August 24th. And it'll go from 6 to 7.30. It'll be a little bit longer. It'll start at 6. And um, this is uh, an opportunity for you to meet three amazing sisters who grew up in a small Kansas town um, in what seemed to be a very Norman Rockwell kind of existence, but behind the closed doors, they were actually living with extreme trauma and emotional neglect, abuse, and incest. And through her work as a facilitator, researcher, activist, and author, the, the eldest sister, Kathleen, became involved in the trauma-informed and resilient moves, resilience movement in the Midwest, and she and her twin sisters, Karen and Sharon, um, are going to be sharing the stories of how they survived and, um, and uh, dealt with the trauma they experienced with the help of their community. And I think that each one of them has a little bit different uh, story to tell. Um, we hope that they will possibly all three be with us. Um, they've recently author, authored a book called Remarkably Resilient Community Matters, uh, which they hope will help others learn uh, how to deal with trauma and healing and thriving after a traumatic um, experience or childhood. So um, we hope that you will uh, all be back with us again next month. If you're on this call now, you will be sent an invitation and um, I believe it will be also possible to um, reach out through our, our website, srqstrong.org, um, to, to sign up for that as well. Yes. So um, I just want to thank you all for being with us tonight. I feel like this is a fantastic session. And again, our greatest gratitude to Lenny for, for sharing his beautiful artwork and his story with us. And, we wish you um, a full-time career as an artist. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Lenny. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.